So she said this class is about cold brew basics and we're just kind of gonna go through at the very um, most basic level, everything there is to know about cold brew, um, how to introduce it to your shop, how to brew your first batch, what the finances look like for something like that, and ultimately where cold brew can go in your shop. So that's what we're gonna be covering today. Um, if there's, I'll ask for questions, but if there are any questions, I have no problem um, just stopping and, and talking through um, anything. So like I said, um, I'll go through my own just story of how I got interested and involved in cold brew. Um, tell you a bit about how Alto came to be and, and where it is now. Um, we'll talk in general about specialty cold brew and kind of how that's different, I guess, than, than cold brew, what I think some of the differences are and, and how we, we look to help grow cold brew. Um, we'll do a recap of cold brew finances, what that looks like for the shop from procuring the equipment to what each batch looks like per cost to what it looks like going out the door to your customers. Um, and then ultimately this five elevating the craft of cold brew is once you have it in your shop, where else can that go? How else can you use it and how else can you maximize that? Um, not only for your profits, but for your customers and introducing, um, better offerings all around. So like she said, um, I'm a civil engineer, so bottom right, that's one of the bridges that my company's building. It's in LA, it's called the Sixth Street Viaduct. Um, we do, we did Levi Stadium, um, the NFL Stadium in San Francisco. We did Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. So we do big infrastructure projects. That's my, that's my day job. Um, that's my wife in the middle, um, my middle school sweetheart. So she, we've been together a long time. And those are our four kids in the Narrows in Zion. So we just kind of go all around where we can and, and um, adventure around kind of uh, really, I guess, the Southwest. So I'm from Riverside, California. That's where I was born. I went to school briefly away and then we're, we're back because we both grew up um, together. And at this office job, that's where I first started liking coffee. I didn't do coffee at all through high school, none, none through college, um, but I started drinking office coffee and office coffee is terrible. And so I loaded it up with as much of the powdered creamer and powdered sugar as I can to make it tolerable. And it was horrible for me. Um, so I had a buddy of mine who was about to open a coffee roastery. He said, you should try cold brew um, and loved it. It was something that was smoother and easier to drink for me than normal coffee. I could enjoy it more times a year because in Southern California, as you can imagine, it's hot more often than it's cold. So cold brew fit um, a lot of things. It checked a lot of boxes for me. And it was better for my diet. I didn't have to load it up with the dairy and the sugar to make it palatable. I liked it as is. He would also make it in drinks for us, um, yeah, like kind of make little lattes, make little mocktails with it, with the cold brew. And so I was like, this is, you know, this is a great drink compared to what I've experienced in, in coffee. This is amazing. And so that's how I got interested in cold brew um, on a personal level and would take just like a flat, like a hydro flask to work and that's how I'd be drinking and enjoying cold brew all the time. And then what happened is he said, um, he had an entire pallet of bottles in his roastery, but he was gonna quit making cold brew. Um, he told us uh, like a, maybe a Christmas party or something. He's like, it's, it's too messy, it's too difficult. I don't know how to bottle it. I don't know how to do um, anything with it. And I just don't wanna mess with it. I'm gonna do hot coffee only in my shop. And I told him, one, you're crazy. Cold brew's gonna be the future. And two, if you don't wanna do it, I'll do it. And so uh, my co-founder Joey and I decided to help him um, essentially run his cold brew program out of his shop. We did it nights and weekends. We both had other things going on, but we liked cold brew so much, believed in the concept. And so not only did we brew his cold brew for him, but we, uh, we bottled it for him. We were bottling mocktails, bottling lattes, and it was a, it was a fun little experiment. It was, a, it was something that we could do nights and weekends to do something that we were both passionate about and then help out a friend. So it was perfect. But we eventually got to the point where we agreed with him um, yeah, this process does suck. It is messy, it is difficult, um, it's not always consistent. How can we make this better? So we started to try to figure out how to make this better and, and most of our complaints came down to um, the filtering process. We were using a paper filter that was often ripping. Uh, we were using a paper filter that um, one of his primary complaints as a specialty coffee shop owner was he thought all cold brew tasted the same. Um, that was his kind of takeaway from it. And one of the things we learned through experimentation is a lot of what tastes the same about cold brew is actually 
the process, not necessarily the coffee. So if you can imagine when you're doing a pour over, one of the first things you'll see anyone do is run hot water over an empty filter and then toss that water because they don't want whatever's in that water, what was ever on that paper in their drink. Then they'll put it back under and they'll put in the coffee, pour over the water and have their drink. And the idea there is that you're rinsing the paper first for any pour over, that's what you'll see um, somebody do. With cold brew, if you're using a paper filter, there's no real way to rinse the cold brew. So everything that's in the bottom of your pour over is in your cold brew drink. And so that's what we were identifying as the common taste. All cold brew tastes the same. That's what we identified as one of the common tastes. And so what we found is that um, by using a different kind of filter, we experimented with dozens, maybe a hundred different kinds of filter materials, that there were certain filter materials that wouldn't impart kind of that paper taste and that were much stronger than paper. So what we did is we just, we just ran an order um, and gave it to him to run in his shop. We said, this will last you six months to a year. You'll be fine, you'll like cold brew. Keep making cold brew, we'll keep buying it. And he ended up giving it away to a bunch of shops um, and they all wanted more. So his supply ran out sooner than it was supposed to and we found ourselves in uh, the cold brew filter business, which wasn't something we necessarily set out to do. We just had a passion for cold brew and the interest in helping um, our friend. And so we founded uh, in 2017 with really just commercial filters and they were just inserts into um, just like a cold brewing bucket. So cold brew, cold brew filters, um, at least in small batches for shops are very simple. It's a pillowcase essentially of paper and, um, or uh, our filter material right here. And this is, uh, it's really simple. All you do is you, you put the cold brew um, in and the idea with cold brewing is that instead of using an increased temperature and a decreased amount of time, that's what hot brewing is, right? You're, you're trying to brew the coffee as fast as you can, hot, and it's gonna run through and it's gonna decrease your amount of time. But it's, it's lifespan of a hot cup of, cup of coffee lasts until it cools down and it starts to change its flavor significantly over time and doesn't last very long. With cold brew, you have a long process. It could be anywhere from maybe 16 to 24 hours. And you're doing that at a low temperature, sometimes even in refrigeration, to extend not only the brewing process, but also extends the shelf life process. You can keep cold brew around in your shop for a few days up to a week, um, and it's stable and tastes the same the first day as it does the fourth. And that's one of the main benefits to a shop of cold brew is it can last longer. You don't have to be um, constantly keeping new fresh batches of hot coffee. Um, so we did that. We started, we had a bunch of, all of our growth has just been really um, in response to what shops have said that they've wanted. So we had filters and they said, hey, do you guys do an entire kit? I just wanna get started. Can you just give me one of everything? And our answer is sure. And then we figured it out and we made them little kits. They said, hey, can we sell home filters to, um, to our customers? Absolutely. We did even home kits. We, um, at one point, Coffee Fest was going to, discontinue a cold brew competition that they'd had for about five years. And that was one of the main reasons we came to Coffee Fest was the cold brew competitions. We, that's, that was our primary interest. And so when they discontinued the older one, um, I think it was, they would have maybe 10 or 12 keg raters all lined up in a row and they'd have to try to coordinate um, a bunch of different material, um, nitrogen, uh, shipments, everything, and that, that sponsor pulled out. And so we raised our hand and said, we still want a cold brew competition. We still think there's value in letting people compete and try to grow cold, you know, grow in cold brew. So can we run it? Um, and we worked out a deal with them. So in 2019, um, we launched US cold brew championships only to have COVID hit and all the, all the um, conventions went away. And so that it took an entire year off um, but during that time, we were still innovating. We were doing cold brew cupping kits, which we can talk about refractometers, which measure the concentration of um, the cold brew. Uh, we're looking in internally just to expand our US manufacturing and um, ultimately running US CBC 2021, which concluded uh, yesterday. So we're growing. It's, a, it's just kind of a story of um, organic growth based on kind of customer demand and, and seeing where the industry is and, and dreaming kind of of where it could go and wanting to be um, a part of that. 
we distinguish ourselves in one way, this idea of kind of specialty cold brew. Specialty coffee, um, I have it here, is just kind of referring to the revolution over the past 10 to 15 years to elevate the craft of coffee. When you hear shops um, talk about that, it's along the lines of innovation, a high focus on quality, the community around coffee, and like a seed to cut mentality. A lot of roasters are looking not only at their own roasting processes, but how the coffee was grown, how it was processed, if it was care was taken in the transport, um, all of that. That's specialty coffee. And what cold brew has been for the longest time is just steeping coffee at room temperature for a long period of time. But it was considered, even maybe as recently as five years ago, a very um, kind of a low end add on, a little bit like looked down upon in specialty coffee. It wasn't high quality enough. It wasn't. Um, good enough really to for coffee shops to really want to feature. And what we decided to kind of promote and really identify is especially cold brew can occur when we provide focus on innovation, when we focus on quality and community um, with something like the competitions or some of the events that we're involved in. Um, and that seed to cut mentality, especially coffee, is applied to cold brew. So we think that there's room for it. Kind of to underscore that point, this was in the July 29, uh, 2021. This is just one of the headlines on Yahoo. Starbucks, as you know, over the past five years has invested heavily in cold brew coffee. Um, they've <laughs> doubled down and tripled down to the point right now that cold beverages at Starbucks are massively outselling coffee in the US. Um, so I clipped this other part too, um, call it a cold brew boom. They say essentially that cold beverages account for 74% of the total domestic beverage sales, which is a new record up 10 percentage points uh, over the past two years. So the nice thing about cold brew in our shops is that Starbucks is doing all the hard work of introducing um, cold brew to our consumers. They, they're, they're showing them what cold brew is and what it can be. And then it's our job and our opportunity um, as smaller shops and smaller roasters to, to take that and even improve the quality beyond Starbucks. Like many of you would, could easily stand in front of anyone and say your coffee is better than Starbucks. The same deal with cold brew. It's, it's once you can make it one step ahead of what Starbucks is producing, but they've done all the hard work of introducing cold brew, of introducing nitro cold brew, all sorts of other beverages. And, and that's where they see the future is. And they've put tens of billions of dollars into marketing and development and promotion of cold brew. And that's a benefit to us. That raises the entire industry of cold brew. And it gives each of our shops more opportunities. Instead of doing filter and espresso based drinks only, you have an entire other category around cold brew. And um, that's what, that's, the specialty cold brew market, they're helping lead, but that, that rising tide kind of lifts all of, all of our boats. And so um, that's, again, where, that's where they see the future. That's where they see explosive growth. And, and like it says, three, three quarters of their sales are, are cold drinks. Um, this is going to be, it's a little bit in depth. I'm happy to share any or all of my slides with anyone who wants them. And your shops are going to have potentially different numbers. So I'm going to talk through these from the equipment that I know. There's a lot of different small batch cold brew coffee equipment that you can use. Um, in the basic form, it's a filter and it's a bucket. All you really need um, it are those two things to, to make cold brew coffee. We can talk as long as you want about why we think our filters um, are better and what some of the enhancements are at our product at, at our booth. So if we want to talk about that, we can. But for now, um, just to run through an actual batch of coffee, what an actual brewer costs, the equipment. So if you're looking to start up cold brew in your shop, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, that's really the goal of this slide. And I'll, I'll start with the conclusion. A single batch of cold brew can often pay for the entire brewer system. They're, not, they're inexpensive. It's one of the easiest things. It's not like an espresso machine that's going to cost you thousands of dollars to, to put in and install and train people on. Cold brew is simple. It's easy. It's the easiest thing you can introduce into a coffee shop. And a single starter kit, um, like I guess in our, in our case would come with 100 filters, that could jumpstart your entire shop with at the bottom right corner, the total profit being upwards of, of $20,000 easily just in a single starter kit. 
So I'll run through the costs here for you because that's an important part of cold brewers to understanding how it impacts um, your bottom line. So on the far left, you see costs. And this is at, at you know, wholesale. You can get coffee, at least where, where we live, anywhere from $30 to $50 for five pounds. Many people will look at that and say, I can roast my own coffee for much cheaper. You're right, you absolutely can. Um, and, and some people may say, hey, I actually buy coffee at a, at a higher price than that. You can put a different number in the spreadsheet and the numbers will still work out um, in your favor. Most of the filters, um, the disposable filter systems um, would, would offer a filter somewhere between uh, maybe a dollar to a dollar fifty in water. I kind of didn't include water. I don't know if anyone's good. It's a few gallons of water. So for the for the purpose of this first column, I just set an average material cost at 41 bucks. That's what it would cost you in coffee, filter, and water to go into your cold brew. Um, this next line here is for the brewing. It's simple. The setup labor, and I can go through that in a second, but it's to open up a filter bag and put it over. Uh, I could do it right here. So this is a brewer. This is a seven gallon brewer. And all you would do to set it up, I mean, you could start the clock, it's not 15 minutes. Um, but I put it in there as, to be conservative, is you put um, your filter over the bucket, you put five pounds of coffee in, you fill the rest of it with water, your five gallons of water, and you put the lid on. And you have started your batch. That's it, it's not complicated. You wanna get your measurements right because you want consistency over time. But how complicated it is was is just that. It's, it's a filter, it's a bucket, it's five pounds of coffee, five gallons of water. Now some shops might say, go ahead, yeah. And your filter is not tearing and that's the point. Not at all, yeah. So like I said, five pounds of coffee um, is what you put in and that's a 10 pound kind of like a medicine ball for working out and um, I mean, that's nothing, because you're gonna pull it out wet, right? So you're gonna have to be able to do that as well. And so, yeah, to answer that question, what we say is our filters don't taste like paper, they don't rip like paper, and they're easier to clean um, than paper. So yeah, that is, that is one of the, the benefits. But you've, you've seen the setup I put in to be conservative, 15 minutes, maybe it takes someone a while to grind the coffee or whatever. Um, to harvest it is really the same thing. All you're gonna do is you're gonna take this off, and I guess I'll show you this because it might be easier to visualize. But you're gonna pull, you're gonna pull a bunch of wet coffee out. It's gonna be dripping. And then what we do is we just slide it into here and it's gonna sit there and drain out. Um, and then there's a spigot on the bottom. When you're done with this, that's just gonna go right in the trash and you have your cold brew concentrate uh, right here. And so that's the reason I have that here is just as a demonstration of how simple the harvest labor is. And then you literally have your bucket of concentrate. And so I estimated, I don't know, total labor of 30 minutes, maybe that's conservative. $15 an hour is $7.50 in labor. So we're not up to a very high expense so far. And that produces around four and a half gallons of concentrate. Uh, what I have here, it says 2.8 to 3.0 TDS, total dissolved solids. That's a measurement of concentration. So one of the things we've been asked for and we um, put out is a refractometer. This measures, you use a little dropper to take some cold brew out once you've thrown away your spent grounds. You take some cold brew out, you put it on here, and it will measure the concentration um, of your coffee. And so it comes out in a concentrate, and so some people will serve it in a concentrate because they're gonna dilute it with milk, they're gonna dilute it maybe even with ice or uh, make it a base of a different kind of drink. But what many people do, just I'm looking for ready to drink, just cup of cold brew, someone who's gonna come in and offer. Many people will dilute it to a concentration that they like, and their concentration might be somewhere between 1.8 to 2.0. Again, this is, you guys are gonna set the parameters based on how you want your coffee to present itself, I mean, to your customer. So you get to choose exactly what it is, but the reason you'd use a refractometer is to keep that consistent over time. You'd be able to um, tell, you know, your baristas, this is how you do it. This is how you keep consistency. And then, um, then they'd be able to accomplish that much easier than kind of them just winging it, right? You, you wanna um, have that as one of your quality steps. And so ultimately, uh, for the sake of kind of this presentation, that will yield around six gallons. So looking at it, when you get to this serve step, you've got six gallons, and then a 700 um, plus ounces, 
If you put that into 12 ounce servings, that yields 64 servings. If you charge $4 a serving, I picked that, that's what Starbucks uses. Um, you, can, you can obviously put what you think your shop can support. Your gross profit is $256. This is one batch. So once you take your profit, you subtract out your costs, you're netting over $200 every batch of coffee, a cold brew that you make and sell. So then the idea here is if you were to have 100 filters in a starter kit, that single $190 investment could yield you a total profit of $20,000 plus. And so the idea is with cold brew, same as coffee. If, if I mean, it, it's simple, but you can run through it really easily. There's almost no equipment cost, almost no labor cost. And um, it's really simple on a per cup basis. So I'll stop there. That's a lot of numbers and thoughts. Is there any questions at all kind of about how the finances worked out or um, if any of those numbers kind of don't make sense to you? Yeah. So you're checking your concentration. What if it's not correct? How do you adjust it? Yeah. So the best way to adjust concentration is through dilution. And that's why oftentimes people will, will um, I guess, brew to a concentrate and then dilute it down. So it might not always yield six, depending on some of the variables. Um, it might yield a little more or a little less, but it, when you're diluting it, you're diluting it to kind of that standard baseline that your, that your shop sets. Now, the other question is, what if your concentrate doesn't come out high enough? And that might be what you're asking. If your concentrate doesn't come off out high enough, oftentimes it has to do with the way that first labor setup was done. So what I didn't show you was oftentimes if you can imagine you have essentially a bag of five pounds of ground coffee, you want to pour that water right through the middle. Oftentimes you're going to want to take some type of a spoon to stir it all up and really make sure that the whole thing is wet. Because what you don't want to have happen is you kind of pour the water around the outsides and the inside stays dry. If that stays dry, you didn't get any extraction from that coffee. That's wasted and you have a very inconsistent and low concentrate when you're done. So that's the main reason why I think you wouldn't get um, the concentrate you want out of, out of the initial brew would just be a failure to, to wet and mix all of the um, cold brew. I know that some shops will actually add an agitation step after it's been steeping for a while. They'll come through and just agitate it a little more because they're just looking for consistency. Same amount of water, same amount of time applied to all the grinds. And so that's an easy step to add. We could put a minute on there for labor if we want, but I, it's an easy step to kind of ensure that, um, that consistency. Did that answer it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, you see all over the place, um, kind of medium to medium coarse. I think that that's been appropriate. That's what we use, a relatively coarse grind. Um, I would say that that's not a limitation based on what the filter can filter out. It's a limitation on how to control the extraction. So oftentimes, the finer it gets, the more difficult it is to saturate all of the coffee evenly. So a nice coarse grind will really let the water flow through. Like you can think of like um, a stack of pebbles as opposed to a stack of clay. <laughs> it's really hard for the water to kind of get through that. But if you have um, slightly bigger, then the water can be passing through and around. Um, so that, that's what we recommend. Um, and a number of these variables, again, each shop can kind of play with to make sure that it's coming out the way you want. And that's one of the things that we recommend. It's hard to give like, and, and we will, I mean, I said five pounds, five gallons, like I'll say a lot of specifics and those are, I would say, starting points for your shop. Those aren't like, um, you know, like that's not some sort of a, a, a mandate or a rule. That's, that's a rule of thumb to start with that. And then you can kind of, um, adjust from there. Yeah. So speaking personally, um, I like it in the light to medium range. And I think that um, <laughs> that's what I like. Um, I think you're going to know your customers better than me. So if I'm giving cold brew to um, like an office or something like that, that would have people of all different ages, I might go to medium to slightly medium dark. I just think the opportunity with cold brew to go lighter exists. And one of the ways that it exists is if you have um, a filter that doesn't that doesn't kind of impart any bad taste. What what we did in our initial testing was um, we sent the filters to at the time the previous three SCA Tasters Cup champions, 
and ask them to blind taste test one against the other. If they could tell a difference, great. If they couldn't, no problem. We're just curious to hear. And all three of them were surprised that they could taste the difference between the cold brew and the processes, and, and all three of them picked, picked our process. And so I would say that because of what we've, what we've developed, there's an opportunity to go lighter and actually get some of those more um, floral, fruity notes into the cold brew itself, and it gives you the opportunity to get a little bit lighter on the scale. I will say that once you get too light, you start to get into almost like a sour type of a taste, and so there is, that's why I would say it like, like medium light, because um, you don't want to get there. I mean, it still has to be palatable to, to a wide enough range of your customers to, to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so I would say kind of uh, this is just a little bit of the idea of, okay, like, so now let's assume that we want to do cold brew. We're going to get the cold brew, and now we have an ability to just create uh, cold brew in our shop. What else can we do with it? Is it like maybe filter coffee where we just sell it as filter coffee only, or is it more like espresso where we can put it into lattes, we can put it into tonics and all sorts of different things? And I'd argue it's the latter. You could do a lot with cold brew, maybe more than both the other two combined. Um, so here's just 10 different ideas, steps that you can do to, I, I would, we call it elevate the craft of cold brew kind of in your shop. And this is um, the shop that we actually first started working with. Our buddy runs this one. And the idea here is that each one of these steps you can kind of find around the room and where I think he's doing a good job of, of elevating the craft of cold brew um, in his shop. So one, we talked about it already serve cold brew, that's step one. And wherever you are on this list, there may be ideas on how you can take one or two more steps going forward. So one, again, um, serve cold brew. A number of the things that we, we talked about, it's easy to get started, it's very approachable. For me, it was the way I got into coffee, beyond office coffee and sugar and, um, and milk. It's very inexpensive, it improves your workflow. It's easy to give samples. That's actually an interesting thing that people don't think about. You can't really give people samples. You can't have batch, but nothing espresso. You're giving them either the full drink or not. But it's like, hey, do you want to just try cold brew? Just give it a shot? That, that might be a way to expand somebody who comes in and gets the same drink each time. You could easily hand them a small little um, bit of cold brew and have them experience something uh, different um, for cold brew. Oh, did I skip two? Where, oh, what happened? <laughs> I got two in there, too. I'll tell you two in a second. Um, but one of the next things you could do um, is serve craft drinks. So craft drinks is a way to kind of um, treat cold brew like you would maybe an alcohol as a base. And you can create something like an old fashioned. You can create something like um, uh, mint mojito. You can do all sorts of different flavor combinations. It can um, present as a latte. You can use the ingredients around your shop. And that's what I want to point out in this one is that all the things that you do for your hot lattes, all the syrups that you have, the milks that you have, even the garnishes that you have, you can have a, a complementing uh, cold brew offering that, that's very similar. But it's also a different menu item for adding zero extra um, products to your shop. You have an entire other offering. It's a cold version of your hot um, uh, a hot drink. It has a higher perceived value and you can always increase the, the value on uh, any drink where you're adding stuff to it and mixing for them. And then it's something that's very easy to rotate seasonally. Um, so you have your cold brew as a base and then you can rotate through some of the syrups, the flavorings, the offerings um, seasonally. Simple syrups are just that. They're very simple. It's sugar and water and a little bit of flavor. Um, so a number of shops that we've seen are kind of promoting that like this is our simple syrup. It's something that we made, it's our own recipe, and that can be something to even further increase kind of the craft nature of the shop and, and distinguish you from, from someone else. So again, those aren't complicated at all. Some people we know are making their own almond milks, um, garnishes, spices, those are the types of things that you can easily add, uh, make or add your own in ingredients to, to differentiate your offering from something that, that someone else might have and to really um, bring something unique to the table. Uh, to serve it on tap, so an easy way to do this, it, it requires a little bit more investment, but a keg grater, you've seen them around the show floor, um, nitro, cold brew, so you can serve it on tap flat where you have a very low Pressure, pressurization of nitrogen, and it comes out exactly like you want it to serve. But many of you maybe have also seen 
where you infuse a bunch of bubbles into the nitrogen, you kind of have that upflowing cascade of bubbles. It's a whole different mouthfeel and taste um, experience. People love getting it on the counter, picking it up and watching the bubbles um, flow. So that's an easy thing to do. Oftentimes people do that with two different taps, one that's still cold brew and one that's nitro. There's a little bit of a different setup. Uh, um, you'd want it on higher nitrogen and sometimes you'd have like a, an aerator, uh, something that would cause more bubbles to form. Um, in, in line so we could talk about that and what other products you might be able to partner with you just your cold brew to do that but it also helps your bar flow it makes it even easier some people will serve cold brew kind of like from a pitcher or, or even from like um, one like with a spout on the bottom this is an easy way to um, pour cold brew for you it improves bar bar flow you can you can put craft drinks like we just talked about a few slides earlier you can put craft drinks actually in the keg itself so you we we know shops that actually will serve craft drinks right from um right from the tap and so again instead of making each one individually they have the ability to um just knock that out uh some of the challenges that you've seen are, are cost maybe the size maybe your shop's so small you don't really know where you're going to put it um that's something to work through and the complexity it's not it's not impossible to figure out, but there's hoses and there's pressure and there's all sorts of different things. It does take a sec. So we have on our website um, kind of like a setup video on how to set one up. There's a number of different videos you can find on, on how to set one up. And oftentimes the kegerator companies themselves will, will have the ability to, to help you out in that process. Um, one of the things that I like is, is actually if they were to offer some type of a growler or way to fill up a lot of cold brew. Um, so you can take home prepared coffee. It's very difficult for a coffee shop to extend that experience beyond um, their shop. They do it by giving you beans, then you have to go and grind and, and brew them at home. But how would you extend that cold brew experience beyond the shop? And you could do that with growlers. Um, you can enjoy it all week. You could take it on trips to work. It's a, it's a branding opportunity for shops to have something then in their customer's house or in their customer's office. Oh, you got that coffee from that shop. I, I love that shop. I should go get coffee from that shop. And it's just a way to, to expand your presence beyond you know, your four walls and let them um, take, uh, take that coffee with them. Cold brew, I don't know if it's off for growlers. If you have a bunch of different varieties, this might work here. But... Um, you can offer samples or flights, and that might better fit into. Did I have that already somewhere? Oh, maybe that was. Huh, maybe that was two samples or flights. But when you do offer samples and flights, what you can do then is let people try a number of different ones and then take home the one they want. That's what beer companies, um, you know, breweries do, right? They have flights, and then you're going to take home um, a growler, a bunch of cans of the favorite one that you tried. Wineries do the exact same thing, right? Try all these wines and then they're going to get you to buy a six pack of the wine that you like the most. Um, and that's the reason they do that. The way then to capitalize on the flight is then to offer, um, a way for them to take that home. And they're really easy to fill with your taps. You can knock that out with no time at all. Um, if you're already doing all those things, another thing you could think about doing is encourage cold brewing at home. Um, it's simple and easy to do. Cold brewing at home is like making tea at home. Um, so it's not impossible at all. Um, you can put like kind of like a um, filter, like home filters up on the shelf next to your um, kind of coffee, the, the roasted coffee. Sometimes people have coffee equipment or other things on their shelves. Um, and it's an easy thing to do because what they're going to do is they're going to grab not only the filters off your shelf but they're going to be grabbing your beans off your shelf and then they get to take it home and brew cold brew themselves um, at home so all those same people who are buying your coffee for hot coffee it gives them an entire other way to enjoy it is to put um, some filters on their shelves and we talked about this earlier but one of my favorite things with cold brew is just encouraging shops to experiment and innovate there is so many different variables that you can play with. Um, we talked about it already, but the roast, uh, the batch size, uh, the duration, the concentration, the equipment, um, there's so many different variables that you can play with. And so it's good, especially at the beginning, to try a bunch and, and pick one, but it's always good to um, not only yourselves, but sometimes even to encourage staff to, hey, try something different 
because that's something that they can then feel a part of the process and maybe they can come up with something you know as good or better than than what you have and so it provides such a flexible base that you really can uh, do a lot with it um, in the picture here you see this is a batch of 50 gallons all that is is just instead of having one tea bag in a small bucket you have a bunch of tea bags in a big bucket the cleanup is is ridiculously easy the cleanup for that takes the same as the cleanup for the other one you're pulling five out instead of one but there's no kind of sediment to dig out or anything like that you are um you're you everything is captured in the filters the entire time and then the way to to kind of check if your experiments and innovations are working uh, we just encourage a blind taste test that's that's what you would do is not to say what you'd want to be successful but really just just test it with your baristas, sometimes even just test it with your customers. Say, which one do you like better? Can you even taste the difference? If you can, which one do you like better? And then you'll know and get some good feedback um, from them. So that's the encouragement there. I would say another way to kind of get involved is to meet other people that cold brew, participate in cold brew events. Um, we do it at Coffee Fest. We do Cold Brew City Fest is the one you see up on top. That's out of uh, San Diego where a bunch of local roasters get together. They put all of their, um, you know, coffee on tap and everyone just gets together a little kind of a local city festival. I know that many cities have something like that. And so to participate in those is always fun. You get to see a bunch of um, customers that wouldn't normally see you, but you also get to learn from the people around you what they're doing and what their customers might like. You get to see kind of innovation. And I would say the same thing locally that it is nationally. A rising tide lifts all boats. If your if your city is invested and interesting in cold, interested in cold brew and promoting it, um, you, you know your customers will be too. Uh, your customers will be, and they'll um, be able to take that experience shop to shop, and and be looking for that. This is an example on the bottom right of a mocktail competition where people were given actually just an incredible variety of different ingredients and challenged to make a mocktail on different themes. So one of them was tropical and they just had a bunch of fruits, bunch of juices, a bunch of different garnishes and their deal one by one V one, just like a latte art competition was who can make the best dr drink based on this theme. It was fun and you could see the, the turnout for it. Also bar flow competitions are ones where you do mix a variety of drinks and, and one of those can always be uh, cold brew. And there's different ways to, to promote specialty cold brew on the menu, at the bar when you're talking to people, um, on your shelves, on social media, and just as you engage with, with other people. So there's, there's a lot of different opportunities in specialty cold brew to kind of get in and be part of that growing industry. And so hopefully, I mean, through this, you've seen that cold brew is simple enough that anyone can do it, is inexpensive enough that it's kind of a no-brainer for almost any menu. There's a ton of uh, profit uh, in it, um, that it's easy to grow and that can easily become a staple and maybe even a full third of, of your menu. But oftentimes, if Starbucks is any judge, it can be a majority um, of your sales. So I'll give you some final thoughts here. We have a few different blog posts. You can find different things on our website. But my challenge is really like kind of where are you? Are you at step zero where you're just considering opening a shop soon? And if so, do I even want to put you know, cold brew in it? Are you, you know, through step four, but maybe some of those other steps are, are worth considering? And it doesn't have to be all of them. I would say that the first person opening a shop on day one doesn't have to do all 10 things, but I would pick a couple um, and even maybe just pick one or two and then have aspirations to grow in a certain direction, just to be thinking about where cold brew can go um, and make your, and leave yourself room to grow in that direction and kind of just get the customer feedback towards um, what they might even want to see and just keep your eyes open, not only in the industry, but around your town um, to see what, see what people are doing and what people like. Uh, so those would be your next steps is to really kind of see where you are on that scale and, and try to identify next steps. And then my last thing is just if there's any questions, I have time now to, to talk about them. If we don't get to all of them, we can, we can talk on the show floor. Yeah. So I just want to, is it the toggle or the time? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, good. So Very similar. You're opening up a shop, a coffee shop in Florida. Nice. It's, everything is cold for there. Like, <laughs> yes, it is, yep. We have a keg writer thing that's going to have eight. We're opening in a couple months, but we, we got one that's got eight. Yep. Um, I have so many questions. Sure. How is this different than the other one? 
Well, so um, the bucket itself, right, is a bucket. We don't claim to be a bucket company, right? And so that's just really a vessel that's easier to put it all in one package. And it's like, hey, just, just give me one of everything so that I can get going on day one. The main difference for us would be the filters. Um, and the filters can work in, you saw stainless steel, the filters can work in any kind of bucket. Most of the people, some of the people will even just kind of go to like a, you know, a local beverage store, like a beer brewing company or something like that. You can easily get buckets in that um, arena. So that that's not what we would consider to be our key innovation. Um, it, it really is the filters. Um, it has to do with um, kind of the strength and the material that we're using and the capacity. Honestly, those can handle, but anywhere between five to 10 um, pounds of coffee. The reason that we don't recommend that much more is really for that saturation, that consistency that we talked about. You can put 10 pounds in there and it's not a weight problem at all. It's just, can you stir and agitate enough to have a consistent extraction? So when they're doing big batches, we don't recommend people go really more than seven or eight pounds, um, but that can still save you a little bit in filter costs, right? If you can go seven or eight pounds instead of you know three to five pounds, then you can be reducing kind of like a, you know, a filter and price on those. How much are just yeah, so um, filters, it's a very similar price point. It's a, it's a decently similar product. What it is um, is 50 filters for around $70 if you're buying one, and then it goes it goes down from there, you know, with bulk, like, like anything, right? It goes down with bulk. So that's why I kind of put it there as like a dollar, dollar fifty a filter, because um, if you get 50 for 70, then it's, it's just over a buck. Fortunately, no. I mean, right? Like, knock on wood, who knows? The whole world changes every five minutes. Um, but right now, we're not. So we manufacture. So I, one of the things I noted was um, US manufacturing. So we're getting a new machine even now delivered that has expanded capacity that we're going to be able to control our own manufacturing. Uh, right now, we have split manufacturing, but it's primarily out of Missouri. Um, but we just want to own and control as much of our um, manufacturing as we can so that we can maintain, um, you know, that, that availability to everyone who works with us. Yeah. Um, have you ever gone into like cold from canning? Yes. Uh, so have I ever gone to, it? I have not, we know we have many of our customers do. So right now we're not like kind of producing or selling any cold brew. We're just, we want to be an equipment company and not compete against anyone we sell to. Um, a number of shops in San Diego, because um, we're from Southern California, so those are the ones we get to spend the most time with, do it. Um, and I'd say they do it successfully. The biggest difficulty when you're saving cold brew for later is that kill stage. Yeah. So in beer, it goes in like super hot, so they don't have to worry about it. And some of the other um, drinks don't have that problem. But for cold brew, the idea of flash pasteurizing like a really hot you know step at some point during the process uh, often can impact you know the the taste and quality of the cold brew but that's the way to get it to extend its canned life so a lot of people are trying to figure out cold brew storage over time the ones you see in the grocery store are often flash pasteurized with heat um, and I guess maybe especially coffee people would say that's why it tastes like, you know, like grocery store cold brew instead of the one like I have in my shop, you know, that's what they would say. So that's very difficult to figure out that kill stage. So people deal with that, I think, in two different ways. You have small enough runs that you're going to go through it all in a week and you have very short um, expiration dates. And that's something that you'll want to, you know, test with your own process and all of that short expiration dates. Um, so that's, that's one option. The other option that I've seen, if you're really looking to go scale, is to put it in, if you put it in plastic containers, there's something called high pressure pasteurization, where instead of heating it up to kill all the microbes or whatever's in there, um, it would be like, like a naked juice or something like that, you know, those little four-sided containers. They put it in a chamber and they pressurize it like crazy, and it actually kills everything that's in there. So that's how... That's how those companies get around pasteurization. They don't want to boil their strawberries and bananas, and so they do it through high pressure. You have to do decently high batches, but you can maintain full quality of your, um, of your product, and so that's one way we've seen it. And another way, like I said, is kind of just to do it in growlers where you feel like, I'll fill it up for you. 
you drink it, but we're not kind of, we're not claiming shelf stable or anything else like that because it is difficult once it gets out of your hands to, to maintain quality and maintain safety. Yeah, have you seen anything else like that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a roaster. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can take home with like a you know a mason jar or whatever. And I was looking at the canning as well because that's another form of distribution, especially grocery stores. Yeah. And that was kind of like I it is on the to do list. <laughs> yeah, it is a tough one. I mean to to expand your coffee, it is really difficult. One of the ways that um, we offer, we do like um, pre-filled packets. Yeah. You'll see even the grocery store like. Um, I think Starbucks has one and maybe some of the other bigger chains, but it's your coffee ground filled in a packet that's already sealed. And so the idea is they just take the packet, they put it in water and they're mixing it. So they don't even have to do the grinding, the dosing, anything. They're able to do that. And that's one way also for you to kind of guarantee your kill. When I say kill stage, you just want to make it safe for the people when they're drinking it. And your kill stage then is the roasting and there's nothing else added to it with the water and like low temperature that that weird temperature that's not safe yeah. so that's one other way you can do it is to try to make like kind of a pre-filled packet and and sell it that way and that's much more shelf stable because we can flush it with nitrogen seal it in a bag and then you they can take that kind of ready to cold brew options um home we have time i think for a couple more you had a question too uh, freeze it um I, I wouldn't see a problem with freezing it. I, I don't know that I ever have. Um, I know actually that we've frozen it like for so that cold brew ice cubes could be in drinks and stuff like that. So it's definitely freezable and it's it's worked for before. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. You see cold brew ice cream all the time. We went to uh, Salt and Straw um, two nights ago and they had a cold brew ice cream. So it's definitely freezable. Yeah, last one, and then I'll be outside if we need to because the next class will want to come in. But yeah. Do you ever see it heated up, and if so, do you lose the smoothness? Yeah, you really do. It kind of it it does mess with the flavor quite a bit to heat it up. Um, I know that that my wife does it because I have cobra all the time, and so if she's not going to make her own coffee, she'll just heat it up. Um, I. I don't think it's necessarily bad, but it changes the flavor, I'll say that. So it does change the flavor to heat it back up. Um, she doesn't mind, she likes it, and sometimes it's easier than, than making coffee for her. So if you're trying to look for a quick little bit of caffeine, that's a way to store it and then get hot coffee when you want.